most chilling witches in history. Welcome back to our channel. Today, we're diving into the dark and eerie world of witchcraft with a look at the most chilling witches in history. From feared figures who haunted the nightmares of their contemporaries to infamous individuals whose dark deeds left an indelible mark on history, we'll uncover the tales of those who shaped the witchcraft narrative. Prepare to be captivated by stories of dark magic, suspicion, and haunting legacies. If you're fascinated by the occult and historical mysteries, make sure to hit that subscribe button and join us on this spine-tingling journey into the past. La Voisin Catherine Monvoisin Catherine Monvoisin, commonly known as La Voisin, stands out as one of the most chilling figures in the annals of history. Born in France around 1640, she became infamous during the reign of King Louis XIV, the Sun King, for her involvement in a dark world of witchcraft, poisonings, and black magic. La Voisin's story is not just about one woman's descent into the occult, but also a reflection of a society steeped in superstition, corruption, and fear. The Rise of La Voisin Catherine Monvoisin was born into a world where mysticism and religion were tightly interwoven with daily life. By the mid-17th century, Paris was a city rife with poverty, inequality, and a deep belief in the supernatural. This environment created fertile ground for individuals like La Voisin, who capitalized on the fears and desires of the populace. La Voisin initially made her mark as a midwife and fortune teller. She had a keen sense of business and quickly expanded her services to include more dubious practices, such as palmistry, potion making, and the creation of love charms. Her clientele ranged from the poor, desperate for a change in their fortunes, to the aristocracy, seeking power, love, and even revenge. As her reputation grew, so did her wealth and influence. She became a key figure in the underbelly of Parisian society, where the lines between religion and witchcraft were blurred. Her home was a hub for those seeking forbidden knowledge, and it is said that she held court with an air of authority that belied her humble beginnings. The Affair of the Poisons La Voisin's most infamous involvement was in the Affair of the Poisons, a scandal that rocked the French court in the late 1670s. This affair involved a network of fortune-tellers, alchemists, and witches who provided poisons and black magic services to the French nobility. The network's activities included everything from concocting lethal poisons to arranging black masses, where the devil was invoked, and human sacrifices were allegedly performed. La Voisin was at the heart of this network. Her clientele included some of the most powerful people in France, including members of the royal court. One of her most notable clients was Madame de Montespan, the chief mistress of King Louis XIV. Madame de Montespan is believed to have sought La Voisin's services to maintain the king's affections and eliminate rivals. This connection brought La Voisin into the highest circles of power, but it also marked the beginning of her downfall. The affair of the poisons was uncovered when several members of the aristocracy died under mysterious circumstances, and investigations led back to the shadowy world of Parisian witchcraft. The resulting scandal was massive, leading to a series of arrests, trials, and executions. La Voisin was arrested in 1679, and under torture, she confessed to a litany of crimes, including murder, witchcraft, and organizing black masses. She claimed that she had even conspired to kill the king himself, although the truth of this remains uncertain. The Dark Arts and Black Masses One of the most terrifying aspects of La Voisin's career was her involvement in black masses. These ceremonies, which inverted the traditional Christian mass, were believed to summon the devil and invoke his power. According to reports from the time, these masses often involved ritualistic elements that were both blasphemous and horrifying, including the sacrifice of infants. La Voisin allegedly performed these masses with the assistance of renegade priests, who would recite the mass in reverse and desecrate holy objects. The ceremonies were meant to ensure the success of her clients' desires, whether they were related to love, wealth, or power. 
The most infamous of these was said to have been held for Madame de Montespan, who purportedly sought to retain King Louis XIV's affection. The existence of these black masses underscores the extent to which La Voisin's operations were not merely about money or influence, they were also about wielding power in its most sinister form. The fact that members of the aristocracy participated in such rites speaks volumes about the desperation and moral decay present within the upper echelons of society at the time. The Fall of La Voisin La Voisin's downfall was as dramatic as her rise. Once the affair of the poisons began to unravel, the full scope of her operations came to light. In 1679, she was arrested and interrogated. The details of her confessions were both shocking and incriminating. She admitted to selling poisons that resulted in the deaths of hundreds of people and to performing black masses that defiled the sacred elements of Christianity. Despite her confession, La Voisin remained defiant until the end. She refused to implicate many of her high-profile clients, perhaps out of fear or loyalty. Nevertheless, the evidence against her was overwhelming, and she was convicted of witchcraft and sentenced to death. On February 22, 1680, La Voisin was burned at the stake in Paris, a fittingly gruesome end for a woman who had become synonymous with evil. Her execution marked the beginning of the end for the affair of the poisons, but the reverberations of her actions were felt long after her death. The scandal prompted a widespread witch hunt across France, with many of La Voisin's associates and clients arrested, tried, and executed. King Louis XIV, seeking to distance himself from the scandal, ordered the destruction of many documents related to the affair, ensuring that some of its darkest secrets would never be fully revealed. The Legacy of La Voisin La Voisin's legacy is one of infamy. She is remembered as one of history's most chilling witches, a woman who wielded power and influence through fear and manipulation. Her story is a reminder of the dark undercurrents that can exist beneath the surface of society, where desperation and superstition can lead people down dangerous paths. However, La Voisin's story is also a reflection of the times in which she lived. The 17th century was a period of great turmoil in France, with political instability, religious conflict, and social inequality creating a breeding ground for fear and superstition. The rise of figures like La Voisin can be seen as a response to these pressures, as people sought out alternative means of gaining control over their lives. In many ways, La Voisin was a product of her environment. Her ability to exploit the fears and desires of others speaks to her cunning and understanding of human nature. Yet, it also highlights the vulnerability of a society where the boundaries between good and evil were often blurred. The fact that she was able to operate for so long, and with such impunity, suggests that there were many who were willing to look the other way in exchange for what she offered. La Voisin's tale also offers insights into the role of women in the early modern period. Despite living in a patriarchal society, she carved out a space for herself in a world dominated by men. Her success, however, was not just due to her business acumen, but also her willingness to engage in activities that were considered taboo. This defiance of social norms may have contributed to her ultimate downfall, but it also ensured that her name would be remembered. The story of La Voisin is one of darkness, power, and fear. It is a story that continues to captivate because it speaks to the timeless themes of human nature, the desire for power, the fear of the unknown, and the consequences of crossing moral boundaries. La Voisin remains a haunting figure, a reminder of the dark side of human ambition and the dangers of unchecked power. The Intersection of Religion and Witchcraft La Voisin's activities also highlight the complex relationship between religion and witchcraft in the 17th century. At a time when the Catholic Church held significant power in France, the existence of a network of individuals who engaged in practices that directly opposed church teachings was both shocking and indicative of broader social tensions. La Voisin's black masses were particularly blasphemous, not just because they involved sacrilegious acts, but because they represented a direct challenge to the church's authority. 
the fact that these masses were attended by members of the aristocracy, who were supposed to be the guardians of Christian morality, suggests that there was a deep-seated disillusionment with the established religious order. This disillusionment can be partly attributed to the church's failure to address the social and economic problems of the time. As poverty and inequality increased, many people turned to alternative sources of power and comfort, including witchcraft. La Voisin, with her blend of mysticism and practical solutions, provided an appealing alternative to those who felt abandoned by the church. The church's response to La Voisin and the affair of the poisons was one of condemnation and repression. The scandal led to a renewed focus on rooting out heresy and witchcraft, with the church playing a central role in the subsequent trials and executions. This response was not just about punishing those involved, but also about reasserting the church's authority in a society where its influence was increasingly being challenged. Catherine Monvoisin, known as La Voisin, remains one of the most chilling witches in history, not just because of her deeds, but because of what she represents. Her story is a window into a world where the lines between good and evil, religion and witchcraft, were dangerously blurred. It is a story of power, ambition, and the consequences of living in a society steeped in fear and superstition. La Voisin's legacy is a reminder of the dark potential that lies within us all and the dangers of allowing fear and desire to override morality. Her tale is a haunting one, but it is also a cautionary one, warning of the consequences of seeking power at any cost. In remembering La Voisin, we remember not just a woman who dabbled in the dark arts, but a society that allowed such darkness to flourish. Isabel Gaudai To fully grasp the significance of Isabel Gaudi's story, it is crucial to understand the broader context of the Scottish witch hunts. The 16th and 17th centuries were a time of great religious, social, and political upheaval in Scotland. The Reformation had brought about significant changes in religious practices and beliefs, leading to an intense fear of heresy and the devil's influence. Witchcraft was seen as a particularly heinous crime, not just against individuals but against the entire community and the state, as it was believed to involve a pact with the devil himself. Scotland was particularly fervent in its persecution of witches, with estimates suggesting that around 3,837 people were accused of witchcraft between 1563 and 1736. Of these, a significant proportion were executed, often by burning at the stake. The fear of witches was not just confined to the authorities, it permeated all levels of society, with ordinary people often initiating accusations against their neighbors. The social dynamics of small, close-knit communities, combined with the harsh realities of life in 17th century Scotland, created a fertile ground for paranoia and suspicion to flourish. Isabel Gowdy's Confessions Isabel Gowdy's Confessions, given in Alden, a village in the Scottish Highlands, are among the most detailed and chilling ever recorded. Unlike many other accused witches of the time, who were often subjected to intense torture to extract confessions, there is no evidence that Gowdy was tortured. Her confessions appear to have been given voluntarily, although it is important to recognize the psychological pressure she would have been under, given the context of the time. Gaudi's confessions are remarkable for their vividness and detail. She described in graphic terms her supposed involvement in witchcraft, including making a pact with the devil, participating in sabbats, and casting spells to harm others. She claimed that she and other witches could transform into animals, including hares, cats, and crows, by reciting certain incantations. One of the most famous passages from her confession describes this transformation. We can raise the wind whenever we please, and make it blow in any quarter we wish, by casting up the dust from the highway, and crying, rise, wind. Gaudai also described how she and other witches would fly through the air to attend gatherings, or sabbats, with the devil. These meetings, she claimed, were held in various locations, including the Downy Hills and local churches, which were believed to be haunted or possessed by evil spirits. During these gatherings, the witches would feast, dance, 
and engage in various forms of debauchery, all under the watchful eye of the devil, who was said to take on various forms, including that of a man, a horse, or even a raven. The Dark and Chilling Nature of Gaudi's Confessions What makes Gaudi's confessions particularly chilling is the way in which they reflect the deeply ingrained fears and beliefs of the time. Her descriptions of witchcraft are not just fantastical tales, they are a window into the collective psyche of a society gripped by fear and superstition. The vividness of her account suggests that these were not merely the product of a fevered imagination, but rather a reflection of the stories and beliefs that were prevalent in her community. One of the most disturbing aspects of Gaudi's confessions is her detailed description of maleficium, or harmful magic. She claimed that she and other witches had caused the deaths of several people through their spells, including a local minister. Gaudi described how they would create effigies, or puppets, of their victims, which they would then mutilate or destroy to cause harm to the person they represented. This practice of sympathetic magic was a common feature of witchcraft beliefs in Europe, and Gaudi's descriptions are among the most detailed on record. Gaudi also described in chilling detail the various punishments that awaited those who crossed the witches. She claimed that they could cause illness, infertility, and even death, using nothing more than their will and a few simple rituals. These descriptions would have struck fear into the hearts of her contemporaries, who believed that witches were capable of wielding real, tangible power over their lives. The Influence of the Devil in Gaudi's Confessions Central to Gaudi's Confessions is the figure of the devil, who she claimed was the source of her power and the leader of the witches. She described how she and other witches had made a pact with the devil, pledging their loyalty to him in exchange for his protection and the ability to perform magic. This pact was sealed with a ceremonial act, in which the witches renounced their Christian faith and received a new name from the devil, who would then mark them as his own. Gaudi's descriptions of the devil are particularly chilling. She claimed that he would appear to the witches in various forms, sometimes as a man with cloven hooves, other times as a black dog or a raven. He was said to be both terrifying and charismatic, demanding absolute obedience from his followers while also bestowing upon them the powers they desired. The devil in Gaudi's confessions is not just a figure of religious evil, he is a very real, tangible presence, capable of manifesting in the physical world and exerting his influence over the lives of ordinary people. This focus on the devil reflects the broader beliefs of the time, when the devil was seen as an ever-present threat, constantly seeking to corrupt and destroy humanity. The idea of a pact with the devil was a central feature of witchcraft beliefs, and Gaudi's confessions provide one of the most detailed descriptions of this concept in the historical record. The Psychological Impact and Legacy of Gaudi's Story The psychological impact of Gaudi's confessions on her community, and on the broader Scottish society, would have been profound. Her detailed accounts of witchcraft, combined with the fear and superstition of the time, would have reinforced the belief that witches were real, dangerous, and actively working to harm others. This belief, in turn, would have fueled further accusations and witch hunts, as people sought to root out and destroy those they believed to be in league with the devil. Gaudi's story also had a lasting impact on the way witchcraft was understood and portrayed in Scotland and beyond. Her confessions have been studied extensively by historians, anthropologists, and folklorists, who see them as a key source for understanding the beliefs and practices associated with witchcraft during this period. The vividness and detail of her accounts have made her one of the most well-known and frequently cited figures in the history of the Scottish witch hunts. In more recent times, Gaudi's story has also been the inspiration for various works of literature, music, and art. For example, the Scottish composer James Macmillan created a piece titled The Confession of Isabel Gaudi in 1990, which was inspired by her story. This work, which has been widely performed and recorded, captures the haunting and tragic nature of Gaudi's life and death, and serves as a powerful reminder of the dangers of superstition and persecution. The Chilling Legacy of Isabel Gaudi 
Isabel Gaudi's story is a chilling reminder of the dark and dangerous world in which she lived, where fear, superstition, and religious zeal could lead to the persecution and execution of innocent people. Her confessions, whether they were the product of a vivid imagination, psychological pressure, or a genuine belief in her own guilt, provide a unique and terrifying insight into the mindset of the time. Gaudi's legacy is a complex one. On one hand, she is remembered as a victim of the witch hunts, a tragic figure who was caught up in the hysteria and fear of her time. On the other hand, her detailed and vivid confessions have immortalized her as one of the most chilling witches in history, a figure whose story continues to fascinate and horrify people to this day. Her story serves as both a cautionary tale about the dangers of superstition and a window into the dark, fearful world of 17th century Scotland. In a time when belief in the supernatural was pervasive, and the line between the real and the imagined was often blurred, Isabel Gaudi's confessions stand as a testament to the power of fear and the human capacity for cruelty in the name of righteousness. As we reflect on Gaudi's story, it is important to remember the countless other women and men who, like her, were accused of witchcraft and suffered horrific fates as a result. Their stories, like Gaudi's, are a stark reminder of the dangers of scapegoating and persecution, and of the need for compassion and understanding in the face of fear and ignorance. Alice Keitler Alice Keitler was born around 1280 into a wealthy, Norman Irish family. Her father, probably a successful merchant or landowner, ensured that Alice grew up in an environment of privilege and influence. This status would play a significant role in both her rise to power and her eventual downfall. Kilkenny, where Alice lived, was a prosperous town, benefiting from the Norman invasion of Ireland, which brought new opportunities for trade and commerce. Alice married four times, each time to wealthy men, and each of these unions increased her wealth and influence. Her first husband, William Outlaw, was a banker and a man of significant standing in Kilkenny. After his death, Alice married Adam Leblund, a wealthy moneylender. Following his demise, she married Richard de Vale, another man of wealth, and finally, she wed Sir John Lepoa. The pattern of her marriages and the subsequent deaths of her husbands began to arouse suspicion. By the time Sir John Lepoa fell ill, rumors had started to circulate that Alice was not just a woman of wealth and influence, but a practitioner of the dark arts, using sorcery to eliminate her spouses and amass her fortune. Accusations and Witchcraft The accusations against Alice Keitler were not just the product of local gossip, but were deeply intertwined with the social and religious dynamics of the time. Medieval Ireland, like much of Europe, was a society governed by the Catholic Church, and the fear of heresy and witchcraft was pervasive. The Church was the ultimate authority, and anything that threatened its dominance was met with severe punishment. Alice's downfall began when Sir John Lepoa, her fourth husband, fell gravely ill. He complained of being gradually poisoned, and as his condition worsened, his suspicions grew. On his deathbed, he accused Alice of using witchcraft to hasten his end. Following his death, Sir John's children from a previous marriage, along with the children of Alice's previous husbands, brought formal charges against her. They claimed she had bewitched their fathers, leading to their untimely deaths. The charges were serious and numerous. Alice was accused of practicing witchcraft, engaging in demon worship, and sacrificing animals in dark rituals. It was said that she had a familiar, a demonic spirit in the form of a black dog or cat, which assisted her in her nefarious deeds. Additionally, she was accused of using potions and powders to manipulate and harm others. One of the most chilling accusations was that Alice had participated in a coven, where she and her followers would perform rituals invoking demons and casting curses. These allegations were a potent mix of misogyny, fear of the unknown, and a reaction to Alice's considerable wealth and influence, which made her a target for those who sought to bring her down. The Trial and Escape The trial of Alice Keitler is one of the earliest recorded witch trials in Europe, and it set a precedent for many that would follow. 
The trial was overseen by Richard de Ladreed, the Bishop of Ossory, a man known for his zealotry and his determination to root out heresy and witchcraft. Bishop Ladreed was relentless in his pursuit of Alice, seeing her as a symbol of the corruption and sin he believed was rampant in society. From the start, the trial was highly unusual. Alice, using her wealth and connections, managed to evade immediate arrest. She even had Bishop Ladreed imprisoned at one point, using her influence with secular authorities. However, the bishop was undeterred and continued to press the case against her. Eventually, Alice was captured and put on trial, though the proceedings were far from fair or just. The trial was filled with sensational testimonies and accusations, many of which were likely fabricated or exaggerated. Witnesses claimed to have seen Alice performing dark rituals, consorting with demons, and engaging in all manner of witchcraft. The most damning testimony came from Alice's maidservant, Petronilla de Meath, who, under severe torture, confessed to being an accomplice in Alice's sorcery. Petronilla's confession included details of rituals, the summoning of demons, and the use of potions to kill Alice's husbands. Despite the gravity of the charges, Alice Keitler managed to escape. Historians believe that she fled to England, where she disappeared from the historical record. Her escape was likely facilitated by her powerful connections and considerable wealth, which allowed her to avoid the fate that befell many accused witches in later centuries. In her absence, the wrath of the church fell on her followers. Petronilla de Meath was burned at the stake, becoming the first person in Ireland to be executed for witchcraft. Her death marked the beginning of the witch hunts in Ireland and served as a grim warning to others who might be accused of heresy or witchcraft. The Legacy of Alice Keitler The story of Alice Keitler is not just a tale of witchcraft, but a reflection of the complex social, religious, and political dynamics of medieval Ireland. Her trial marked a significant moment in the history of witchcraft accusations, setting a precedent for how such cases would be handled in the future. It also highlighted the ways in which powerful women were often targeted in societies where their influence was seen as a threat to the established order. Alice's case is also notable for the role that misogyny played in her downfall. As a wealthy and independent woman, she was an anomaly in a society where women were expected to be subservient and dependent on men. Her multiple marriages, accumulation of wealth, and the deaths of her husbands made her an easy target for those looking to explain away her success through the lens of witchcraft. This pattern of targeting powerful women would become a common theme in witch trials across Europe in the centuries that followed. The chilling nature of Alice's story lies not just in the accusations of witchcraft, but in the way her life and the lives of those around her were destroyed by fear and superstition. The idea that a woman could wield such power through dark forces was terrifying to the medieval mind, and Alice's story became a cautionary tale about the dangers of female independence and influence. Historical Interpretations and Modern Reflections over the centuries, historians and scholars have interpreted the story of Alice Keitler in various ways. Some see her as a victim of a misogynistic society that could not tolerate a powerful woman, while others view her as a cunning and manipulative figure who used her position to exploit others. The truth likely lies somewhere in between, with Alice being both a product of her time and a person who defied the expectations placed upon her. Modern interpretations of Alice's story also highlight the ways in which accusations of witchcraft were often used as a tool to control and punish those who did not conform to societal norms. The witch hunts that followed in later centuries were fueled by similar fears and prejudices, leading to the persecution and execution of countless innocent people, mostly women. Alice Keitler's legacy continues to resonate today as a symbol of the dangers of superstition, fear, and the oppression of women. Her story is a reminder of how easily societies can turn on those who are different or who challenge the status quo, using accusations of witchcraft or other forms of heresy to justify their actions. Alice Keitler's tale is one of power, fear, and the darker side of human nature. Her story, though set in medieval Ireland, 
echoes through the centuries, providing insight into the origins of the witch hunts that would later engulf Europe. As the first person in Ireland to be accused of witchcraft, Alice's life and trial offer a chilling reminder of how fear and superstition can lead to the persecution of those who do not fit within the narrow confines of societal expectations. Her escape and subsequent disappearance add an element of mystery to her story, leaving historians and scholars to wonder what became of this enigmatic figure. Whether seen as a villain or a victim, Alice Keitler remains one of the most chilling witches in history, her story a testament to the power of fear and the lengths to which people will go to protect their beliefs and their way of life. Mother Shipton Ursula Southile was reportedly born in a cave in Nesborough, North Yorkshire, under circumstances that were anything but ordinary. According to legend, her mother, Agatha Southile, was an unwed teenager with no known father for the child, which cast a shadow of illegitimacy over Ursula from the start. Some stories suggest that Ursula's conception was the result of a liaison with the devil, adding to the aura of supernatural mystery that surrounded her birth. This connection to the diabolical would follow Ursula throughout her life, feeding into the fears and superstitions of the time. From an early age, Ursula was different, Accounts describe her as having an unusual appearance, with a crooked nose, bent back, and deformed limbs. These physical deformities, combined with the circumstances of her birth, led to her being ostracized by the local community. She was believed to have magical powers, a reputation that would only grow as she aged. The making of Mother Shipton, a prophetic witch, Ursula's transformation into the figure known as Mother Shipton came as her prophetic abilities became widely known. Unlike many so-called witches of the time, Mother Shipton was not accused of practicing malevolent magic or witchcraft in the traditional sense. Instead, she was revered and feared for her ability to foresee the future. Her prophecies covered a wide range of topics, from the mundane to the catastrophic. She predicted everything from local events, such as the fates of her neighbors, to more significant occurrences that would impact the entire country. Some of her most famous prophecies included the Great Fire of London in 1666, the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588, and even the invention of iron ships. However, it's essential to note that the accuracy of these prophecies has been debated by historians and scholars. The first known publication of her prophecies did not appear until the 17th century, long after her death, leading many to believe that these predictions were either fabricated or heavily embellished by later writers. Despite this, the belief in her powers persisted, and her prophecies became a part of the cultural fabric of England. The Witch of Nesborough, Supernatural Abilities and Influence Mother Shipton's reputation as a witch was not solely based on her prophesies. She was also believed to possess other supernatural abilities. According to legend, she could cast spells, control the weather, and had the power to curse those who wronged her. These stories were likely exaggerated by the local population, who were steeped in superstition and eager to believe in the existence of witches. One of the most famous stories about Mother Shipton involves her cursing a local nobleman, Lord Percy, who had ridiculed her. It is said that she predicted his downfall and that of his family, a prophecy that allegedly came true. Whether or not this story is factual, it reflects the fear and respect that Mother Shipton commanded in her community. Her influence was not limited to Nesborough. Tales of her powers and prophesies spread throughout England, and she became a figure of both fear and fascination. In a time when belief in witches was widespread, and the persecution of supposed witches was common, Mother Shipton managed to avoid the fate that befell many others accused of witchcraft. This might have been due to the respect, and perhaps fear, that her prophesies inspired, protecting her from the wrath of those who might otherwise have sought to destroy her. The Prophetic Legacy, How Mother Shipton's Prediction Shaped History the legacy of Mother Shipton's prophesies is a testament to the power of myth and legend in shaping history. Over the centuries, her predictions have been revisited and reinterpreted to fit the context of the times. 
During periods of crisis or uncertainty, people often turn to her prophesies for guidance, seeing in them a forewarning of events to come. One of the most enduring aspects of her legacy is the way her prophesies have been used to explain and rationalize significant historical events. The Great Fire of London, for example, was seen by some as a fulfillment of her prediction that London would be destroyed by fire and plague. Similarly, the defeat of the Spanish Armada was interpreted as a manifestation of her prophecy about England's triumph over its enemies. These interpretations, while often dubious, highlight the role that prophecy and superstition played in the lives of people during the Renaissance and early modern periods. In a world where science and reason had not yet fully taken hold, the words of a prophet like Mother Shipton could wield considerable influence. Mother Shipton's Cave, a site of pilgrimage and superstition. Today, the cave where Mother Shipton was born has become a site of pilgrimage and tourist attraction. Located near the town of Nesborough, Mother Shipton's Cave is often referred to as England's oldest tourist attraction, with visitors coming to see the place where the legendary witch was born and to marvel at the petrifying well nearby. The petrifying well, once known as the dropping well, is a geological curiosity where objects left in the water gradually turn to stone due to the high mineral content of the water. This phenomenon, long before it was understood scientifically, was seen as further proof of Mother Shipton's supernatural powers. Even today, the well adds to the mystical atmosphere of the site, drawing those who are fascinated by the intersection of natural wonders and supernatural legend. The cave and well are steeped in the lore of Mother Shipton, and visitors can explore the site while learning about her life and prophesies. While much of what is presented is based on legend rather than historical fact, the site serves as a testament to the enduring power of her story. The Cultural Impact, Mother Shipton in Literature and Art Mother Shipton's influence extends beyond the realm of folklore and superstition, she has also left a lasting mark on literature and art. Over the centuries, she has been featured in numerous works of fiction, poetry, and plays, often portrayed as a wise and mysterious figure, though sometimes as a malevolent witch. One of the earliest literary references to Mother Shipton appears in the 17th century, where she is mentioned in pamphlets and books that chronicled her prophesies. These early publications helped cement her reputation as a prophetess and spread her fame beyond the borders of Yorkshire. In the 19th century, Mother Shipton's legend was revived by writers such as Charles Hindley, who published a collection of her prophesies, though many were likely fabricated or altered. This period saw a resurgence of interest in folklore and the supernatural, and Mother Shipton's story fit perfectly into the Victorian fascination with the occult. Her influence can also be seen in visual art, where she has been depicted as everything from a hideous hag to a more benign, grandmotherly figure. These varied representations reflect the dual nature of her legend, she is both feared and respected, a figure of both darkness and wisdom. Debunking the myth, skepticism and historical analysis. While the legend of Mother Shipton is compelling, it is important to approach it with a critical eye. Many historians and scholars have pointed out the lack of contemporary evidence to support the claims made about her life and prophesies. The first known written accounts of her prophesies did not appear until nearly a century after her death, raising questions about their authenticity. Some scholars believe that Mother Shipton may have been a fictional or semi-fictional character created or embellished by later writers to capitalize on the public's fascination with prophecy and witchcraft. The inclusion of anachronistic predictions, such as references to future technological advancements, suggests that many of the prophecies attributed to her were likely created long after her death. Despite this skepticism, the legend of Mother Shipton endures. Whether or not she was a real person, or merely a creation of folklore, her story continues to captivate the imagination. The figure of Mother Shipton serves as a reminder of the power of myth and the ways in which history can be shaped by the stories we tell. The Enduring Legacy of Mother Shipton Mother Shipton, whether as a historical figure or a mythical creation, occupies a unique place in the annals of English folklore. 
Her story is one of mystery, prophecy, and supernatural power, blending elements of fear and fascination that have kept her legend alive for centuries. In many ways, Mother Shipton represents the archetype of the wise woman or witch, a figure who is both feared and revered for her knowledge of the unknown. Her prophesies, real or imagined, speak to a deep-seated human need to understand and predict the future, to find meaning in the chaos of life. Today, Mother Shipton is remembered not just as a chilling witch, but as a symbol of the enduring power of folklore and the supernatural. Her cave in Nesborough remains a place of pilgrimage, a physical manifestation of the legend that has captivated generations. As long as people are drawn to the mysteries of the past and the possibilities of the future, the legend of Mother Shipton will continue to thrive, a testament to the enduring appeal of one of history's most enigmatic witches. Agnes Sampson To understand the chilling tale of Agnes Sampson, one must first grasp the context of 16th century Scotland. This was a time of great religious upheaval, political tension, and widespread fear of the supernatural. The Protestant Reformation had swept through Scotland, leading to the establishment of the Church of Scotland, which was fervently opposed to Catholicism and anything that smacked of heresy, including witchcraft. King James VI of Scotland, who would later become James I of England, was particularly obsessed with the idea of witchcraft. His interest in the subject was piqued after his marriage to Anne of Denmark in 1589. During their voyage from Denmark to Scotland, a series of storms nearly wrecked their ship, which James interpreted as the work of witches. This belief was reinforced during his stay in Denmark, a country already gripped by witch hunts. Upon his return to Scotland, James became convinced that witches were plotting against him and his reign, leading to a campaign of persecution that would claim the lives of many innocent people. Agnes Sampson, the wise woman of Keith. Agnes Sampson was born in the mid-16th century in Haddingtonshire, Scotland, although little is known about her early life. By the time of her arrest, she was a well-respected woman in her community, known for her knowledge of herbal remedies, midwifery, and healing practices. In an age when medical knowledge was rudimentary at best, women like Agnes were often the only source of medical care for their communities. However, this knowledge also made them targets during times of fear and uncertainty. Sampson was known as the wise wife of Keith, a title that reflected her expertise and the trust that her community placed in her. Yet, this title would also seal her fate when the hysteria of witchcraft accusations began to spread. The North Berwick Witch Trials The North Berwick Witch Trials began in 1590, following the near-disastrous voyage of King James and Queen Anne. The trials were among the first in Scotland to involve multiple accused witches, and they would become some of the most infamous in the history of European witch hunts. The spark for these trials was the confession of a young maid named Jalus Duncan. Jalus was employed by a local bailiff, David Seaton, who grew suspicious of her frequent absences and sudden acquisition of healing skills. Under torture, Jalus confessed to witchcraft and implicated several others, including Agnes Sampson. Sampson was arrested in November 1590 and taken to Holyrood Palace in Edinburgh for interrogation. King James himself took a personal interest in her case, convinced that she was part of a vast conspiracy against him. What followed was a series of torturous interrogations that would force Agnes Sampson to confess to heinous crimes she likely did not commit. Torture and Confession The methods used to extract confessions during the witch trials were nothing short of barbaric. Agnes Sampson was subjected to some of the most brutal forms of torture, designed to break her will and force her to admit to witchcraft. One of the most infamous methods was known as the witch's bridle, a device that clamped the victim's head and inserted sharp spikes into their mouth, preventing them from speaking or resting. Sampson was also stripped naked and shaved, a common practice to search for the devil's mark, a physical sign supposedly left by Satan on his followers. This dehumanizing treatment was meant to strip her of her dignity and humanity, making it easier for her interrogators to view her as a witch rather than a person. 
Despite enduring unimaginable pain, Agnes initially denied the charges against her. However, after days of relentless torture, she finally broke. She confessed to a litany of crimes, including causing the storms that had endangered the king's ship, conspiring with other witches, and communicating with the devil. Her confession was filled with the kinds of details that her interrogators expected to hear, likely a result of their suggestions and the intense psychological and physical pressure she was under. One of the most chilling aspects of Sampson's confession was her claim that she had attended a witch's gathering at the North Berwick Kirk, a church near Edinburgh. According to her testimony, this gathering was attended by around 200 witches who plotted the king's downfall. This confession was used to justify the arrest and execution of many others, creating a ripple effect of fear and paranoia throughout Scotland. The Execution Agnes Sampson's confession sealed her fate. In January 1591, she was found guilty of witchcraft and sentenced to death. She was strangled and then burned at the stake, a common method of execution for those convicted of witchcraft in Scotland. Her death was part of a broader wave of executions that claimed the lives of dozens of others accused during the North Berwick Witch Trials. The execution of Agnes Sampson was not just a personal tragedy but also a reflection of the broader societal fears and the consequences of unchecked authority. King James's obsession with witchcraft led to a reign of terror that would leave a lasting stain on Scottish history. Legacy and Reflection the story of Agnes Sampson is a haunting reminder of the dangers of superstition, fear, and the abuse of power. The witch hunts of the 16th and 17th centuries were driven by a combination of religious zealotry, misogyny, and political expediency, leading to the persecution of thousands of innocent people, most of whom were women. Agnes Sampson's case is particularly chilling because of the direct involvement of the king in her persecution. King James V.I.'s role in the North Berwick Witch Trials demonstrates how the fear of witchcraft could be manipulated by those in power to justify acts of cruelty and oppression. James's interest in witchcraft would later lead him to write Demonology, a treatise that further fueled the witch hunts in both Scotland and England. However, the legacy of Agnes Sampson and others like her also serves as a powerful cautionary tale. It highlights the importance of reason, justice, and the protection of individual rights in the face of mass hysteria. The witch hunts of the past may seem distant, but the underlying forces that drove them, fear, ignorance, and the desire to control others, are still present in various forms today. In modern times, Agnes Sampson has become a symbol of the countless women who were wrongfully accused and executed during the witch hunts. Her story is often invoked in discussions about the dangers of scapegoating and the importance of safeguarding human rights against the excesses of power. The psychological impact of witch hunts. One cannot fully grasp the horror of Agnes Sampson's ordeal without considering the psychological impact of the witch hunts on individuals and communities. The fear of witchcraft was deeply ingrained in the psyche of the people, fueled by religious teachings, folklore, and the pervasive belief in the supernatural. This fear created an environment where accusations of witchcraft could easily spiral out of control, leading to widespread panic and the breakdown of social trust. For those accused, like Agnes Sampson, the psychological torment began long before the physical torture. The mere accusation of witchcraft was enough to isolate individuals from their communities, stripping them of their social standing and support networks. The accused were often subjected to public humiliation, with their confessions extracted through torture serving as a spectacle for others. This process not only dehumanized the victims but also reinforced the collective belief in the existence of witches, perpetuating the cycle of fear and persecution. The psychological impact of these trials extended beyond the victims to their families and communities. The fear of being associated with a witch led many to turn against their neighbors, friends, and even family members. Communities were torn apart by suspicion, as people were encouraged to denounce those they believed to be involved in witchcraft. This atmosphere of distrust and paranoia left deep scars on the social fabric, 
with the effects of the witch hunts lingering long after the trials had ended. Gender and the Witch Hunts The story of Agnes Sampson also sheds light on the gendered nature of the witch hunts. The vast majority of those accused of witchcraft were women, reflecting the deeply entrenched misogyny of the time. Women who were older, widowed, or otherwise marginalized were particularly vulnerable to accusations, as they were often seen as easy targets. The association of women with witchcraft was rooted in long-standing cultural beliefs that depicted women as inherently sinful, weak, and more susceptible to the devil's influence. Agnes Sampson, as a healer and midwife, occupied a position that was both respected and feared. Her knowledge of herbs and healing practices was invaluable to her community, yet it also made her a target during times of crisis. The very skills that had earned her the title of wise wife became evidence of her supposed witchcraft when the tides of suspicion turned against her. Her case highlights how women's roles in society could be weaponized against them, with their knowledge and independence perceived as threats to the patriarchal order. The gendered nature of the witch hunts also reflects broader societal anxieties about women's power and autonomy. The fear of witchcraft was often intertwined with fears about female sexuality, fertility, and the disruption of traditional gender roles. By targeting women like Agnes Sampson, the witch hunt served as a means of reinforcing social norms and punishing those who deviated from them. The Enduring Lessons of Agnes Sampson's Story Agnes Sampson's story is one of tragedy and injustice, but it is also a powerful reminder of the dangers of fear and the importance of standing up against oppression. Her life and death illustrate the devastating consequences of unchecked authority, the perils of superstition, and the deep-seated misogyny that fueled the witch hunts. In remembering Agnes Sampson and the countless others who suffered during the witch hunts, we are called to reflect on our own society's vulnerabilities to similar forces. The witch hunts may be a thing of the past, but the underlying dynamics of fear, scapegoating, and the abuse of power are still present in various forms today. Whether in the context of religious persecution, political oppression, or social marginalization, the lessons of Agnes Sampson's story remain relevant. As we continue to confront the challenges of our own time, Agnes Sampson's legacy serves as a poignant reminder of the need for justice, compassion, and vigilance in the face of fear and intolerance. Her story is a testament to the resilience of the human spirit and the enduring importance of standing up for what is right, even in the face of overwhelming odds. Grain N.I. Mahale, Grace O'Malley Grace O'Malley was born in 1530 into the powerful O'Malley clan in County Mayo, Ireland. From an early age, she demonstrated an indomitable spirit, refusing to conform to the traditional gender roles of her time. Her defiance began with cutting off her hair to join her father's seafaring expeditions, earning her the nickname Grain Mal, Bald Grain. Her childhood marked the beginning of her association with the sea, an element deeply connected to both Celtic myth and witchcraft. The sea in Irish mythology is often depicted as a realm of both creation and destruction, governed by powerful female figures such as the sea goddess Fand. Grace's affinity with the sea can be seen as an early sign of her connection to these ancient powers. As she grew older, her reputation as a pirate queen grew, commanding fleets and engaging in daring raids along the Irish coast. However, her seafaring exploits were just one aspect of her formidable presence. To understand how she came to be viewed as a witch, we must examine the folklore that surrounded her life. The Witches of Connaught Ireland has a long and rich tradition of tales about witches, particularly in the province of Connaught, where Grace O'Malley lived. Connaught was considered a wild and untamed land, steeped in magic and mystery. The association of Connaught with witches can be traced back to the ancient Celtic traditions, where women who possessed knowledge of herbs, healing, and the supernatural were both revered and feared. The witches of Connaught were often depicted as fierce, independent women who wielded power in ways that defied societal norms. In many ways, Grace O'Malley embodied these traits. She was a leader, a warrior, and a strategist, 
all roles that were typically reserved for men. Her ability to command respect and instill fear in those around her made her a figure of both admiration and suspicion. As Grace's fame grew, so too did the legend surrounding her. Stories began to circulate that she possessed supernatural abilities, which she used to protect her people and strike fear into her enemies. These tales were likely fueled by her fierce independence and the fact that she often defied the English crown, a powerful entity that sought to control Ireland. In the eyes of her enemies, her ability to evade capture and continue her raids despite overwhelming odds seemed almost supernatural. The Powers of a Sea Witch One of the most persistent legends about Grace O'Malley is that she was a sea witch, a woman who could command the elements and harness the power of the ocean. This belief was not uncommon in the 16th century, a time when sailors were highly superstitious and the sea was seen as a place of mystery and danger. According to folklore, Grace had the ability to calm or raise storms, allowing her ships to navigate treacherous waters or escape from pursuing enemies. Some tales even suggest that she could summon sea creatures to do her bidding, further enhancing her reputation as a witch. These stories are likely exaggerated, but they reflect the fear and all that Grace inspired in those who encountered her. The idea of Grace as a sea witch is further reinforced by her deep connection to the ocean. She spent much of her life at sea, and her understanding of the tides, currents, and winds was unparalleled. To those who did not understand the science behind her maritime skills, it would have seemed as though she possessed a supernatural control over the sea. The Meeting with Queen Elizabeth I One of the most famous episodes in Grace O'Malley's life is her meeting with Queen Elizabeth I in 1593. At the time, Grace was in her 60s and had spent decades defying English authority in Ireland. Her meeting with Elizabeth was a bold move, as she sought to negotiate the release of her sons and secure her lands from English encroachment. The meeting itself is steeped in legend. It is said that Grace refused to bow before the English Queen, stating that she did not recognize her as the ruler of Ireland. This act of defiance was shocking, especially given the rigid court etiquette of the time. However, what truly captured the imagination of those who heard the story were the rumors that surrounded the encounter. According to some accounts, Grace used her supernatural abilities during the meeting. It is said that she cast a spell on Elizabeth, compelling her to agree to Grace's demands. Other stories suggest that she used a form of magical protection, making herself immune to the English Queen's wrath. While these tales are likely fictional, they reflect the belief that Grace possessed powers beyond those of ordinary women. The idea of a powerful Irish witch standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with the English Queen would have been a compelling story, especially in a time when tensions between England and Ireland were high. Grace's ability to secure her demands from Elizabeth would have only added to her reputation as a woman who could not be controlled by the forces of the crown, whether they were political or supernatural. The Dark Side of Power While Grace O'Malley is often portrayed as a heroine, there are also darker aspects to her legend that contribute to her image as a chilling witch. In some stories, she is depicted as a vengeful figure, willing to use any means necessary to protect her people and punish her enemies. This ruthless streak is not uncommon in tales of witches, who are often portrayed as both protectors and destroyers. One such story tells of how Grace took revenge on a nobleman who had wronged her. According to the legend, the nobleman refused to honor an agreement with Grace, and in response, she used her magical powers to curse him. The curse brought misfortune to the nobleman and his family, leading to their downfall. This tale, while likely apocryphal, paints Grace as a woman who was not to be crossed, reinforcing her image as a powerful and dangerous witch. Another story tells of how Grace used her powers to protect her clan from invaders. It is said that she could summon a thick fog to confuse her enemies, allowing her warriors to ambush them. This ability to control the weather is a common theme in witchcraft and further cements Grace's reputation as a master of the supernatural. The Legacy of Grace O'Malley 
Grace O'Malley's legacy as a pirate queen and a potential which has endured for centuries, becoming an integral part of Irish folklore and history. Her story is one of rebellion, power, and mystery, qualities that have made her a fascinating figure for both historians and storytellers. The idea of Grace as a witch, while not historically verified, adds a layer of intrigue to her character. In a time when women were often marginalized and their power was viewed with suspicion, the label of which could be both a weapon and a badge of honor. For Grace, it may have been both. Her ability to defy the English crown and command the respect of her followers made her a target for those who sought to discredit her. In the minds of her enemies, her success could only be explained by supernatural means. However, it is important to recognize that the label of witch was often used to diminish powerful women. By casting them as something other than human, society could rationalize their actions and place them outside the bounds of acceptable behavior. Grace O'Malley, with her fierce independence and refusal to conform, fits the mold of the witch in many ways, but she was also much more than that. Her story is a testament to the strength and resilience of women who refuse to be confined by societal expectations. Whether or not she was truly a witch is a question that may never be answered, but the legends that surround her speak to the enduring fascination with her life and the power she wielded. Grain N. I. Mahale, or Grace O'Malley, is a figure who straddles the line between history and myth. Her life as a pirate queen and leader of men is well documented, but the stories that paint her as a witch had a chilling and mysterious dimension to her legacy. In a world where powerful women were often feared and misunderstood, Grace's reputation as a witch is a reflection of the awe and terror she inspired. As one of the most chilling witches in history, Grace O'Malley embodies the qualities that have long been associated with witchcraft, independence, power, and the ability to defy the natural order. Whether through her command of the sea, her strategic brilliance, or the supernatural tales that surround her, Grace remains an enigmatic and formidable figure, one whose story continues to captivate and inspire. In the end, it is perhaps this blend of history and legend that makes Grace O'Malley such a compelling character. She was a real woman who lived a life of extraordinary adventure and defiance, but she has also become a symbol of something more, a reminder of the power that women can wield, both in the world of men and in the realm of myth. Tituba 1. Background and Early Life Tituba was born around 1680, likely in the Caribbean. Her exact origins are unclear, but she was enslaved by Samuel Paris, the minister of Salem Village, Massachusetts. Her mixed heritage and enslaved status placed her in a vulnerable position in a society that was both racially and socially hierarchical. Her early life and experiences are not well documented, but it's known that she was brought to New England in the early 1680s. By the time she arrived in Salem, Tituba had already lived through significant trauma and displacement. Her role as an enslaved person meant she was at the bottom of the social hierarchy and subject to the whims of her owners. 2. The Salem Witch Trials In the winter of 1692, Salem Village became the epicenter of a witchcraft panic that would engulf colonial Massachusetts. The initial accusations of witchcraft were levied by a group of young girls, including Betty Paris, Samuel Paris's daughter, and Abigail Williams, his niece. The girls exhibited strange behaviors and convulsions, which they claimed were the result of witchcraft. Tituba's role in the trials began when she was accused of practicing witchcraft and engaging in diabolical activities. She was one of the first individuals to be accused and subsequently interrogated. The accusations against her were likely influenced by her outsider status and her association with the Paris family. Her position as an enslaved person made her particularly vulnerable to accusations and mistreatment. 3. The Interrogation and Confession Tituba's interrogation was a turning point in the Salem witch trials. Under intense pressure, she confessed to practicing witchcraft and having made a pact with the devil. Her confession was filled with elements that aligned with the fears and fantasies of the Puritan community. 
She described a vision of a black man, whom she identified as the devil, and claimed that she had seen other witches in the community. Her confession was significant for several reasons. First, it provided the court with a narrative that fit the prevailing fears of witchcraft and the devil. Second, it fueled the hysteria, leading to more accusations and confessions. Tituba's confession was used as evidence against others, and her testimony helped to legitimize and escalate the witch hunt. For racial and social implications. Tituba's story is deeply entwined with the racial and social dynamics of the time. As an enslaved woman of African and Native American heritage, she occupied a precarious position in colonial society. Her status as an outsider made her an easy target for accusations. The racial and cultural prejudices of the time likely influenced how she was perceived and treated. In the Puritan society of Salem, there was a deep-seated fear of the unknown and the other. Tituba's exotic background and her status as an enslaved person meant that she was viewed with suspicion and fear. This xenophobia was a key factor in the witch trials, and Tituba's position made her particularly vulnerable to the hysteria that swept through Salem. 5. The Legacy of Tituba Tituba's legacy is a complex and tragic one. Her role in the Salem witch trials has been mythologized and sensationalized over the centuries. She has been portrayed as a figure of dark magic and malevolence, but this characterization often obscures the reality of her situation. In historical accounts and popular culture, Tituba has been depicted in various ways, from a sinister witch to a victim of circumstance. The truth is likely somewhere in between. Her confession was likely a result of extreme duress and the need to appease the authorities who had already made up their minds about her guilt. Tituba's story is also a reflection of the broader issues of race, gender, and power in early American society. Her experiences highlight the ways in which marginalized individuals were scapegoated and exploited during times of social upheaval. The Salem witch trials were not just a manifestation of religious paranoia, but also a reflection of the deep-seated inequalities and fears of the time. Tituba's place in history as one of the most chilling witches is a product of the intersection of her personal circumstances and the broader socio-cultural context of the Salem witch trials. Her story is a haunting reminder of how fear, prejudice, and social hierarchy can drive people to commit grievous injustices. While Tituba's legacy is often overshadowed by sensationalized accounts, it is crucial to remember her as a real person who suffered immensely during a time of great turmoil. Her story serves as a cautionary tale about the dangers of scapegoating and the impact of systemic injustice. In examining her life and the trials, we gain insight into the complex dynamics of early American colonial society and the enduring consequences of fear and prejudice. Thanks for watching our deep dive into the most chilling witches in history. If you enjoyed exploring these dark and mysterious figures with us, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe for more spine-tingling content. Leave a comment below with your thoughts or any other historical figures you'd like us to cover. For even more thrilling stories, check out our other videos and follow us on social media for updates and behind-the-scenes content. Until next time, stay curious and keep exploring the shadows of history. Remember, the past is never as dead as it seems.